Hi, this is Dr. Kat Vlies from Central New Mexico Community College. We've reached our last video on the endocrine system, which focuses on the pancreas. We've covered the pancreas before when we studied the digestive system, and there we studied the pancreas based on its exocrine functions, meaning the pancreas is not just a gland that produces hormones, that is glucagon and insulin, making it therefore an endocrine gland, but remember it also produces many enzymes needed for digestion and also a pancreatic juice that's rich in bicarbonate ions. The ducts are all going to be part of the exocrine function of the pancreas. Hormones are always going to be released into the interstitial fluid, or in the case of glucagon and insulin, um, these hormones are going to enter into the bloodstream instead, not into ducts. Recall, too, that the pancreas sits retroperitoneal, together with the kidneys, together with a good portion of the duodenum and a good portion of the large intestine. And it sits nicely tucked away pretty much behind or posterior to the stomach. So the stomach covers a good portion of the, um, the pancreas. So in the pancreas, you learned about all the little acinar cells that form your little acinar sacs, essentially. And that's where we see the secretion of the enzymes occurring together with the pancreatic juice. But in addition to that, we have cells, alpha and beta cells, that organize themselves into these little islets. We can call them pancreatic islets or often you'll hear me call them the islets of Langerhans. They really stand out on a slide, so if you're looking at slides of the pancreas, then you can really see these big patches of cells that look very different from all the other ACNR cells. So the two hormones for the pancreas are insulin, which all of you have heard plenty about in association with diabetes mellitus, but another important hormone that tends to work more opposite insulin is called glucagon. So let's get started with that. Be careful, don't confuse this with the polysaccharide called um, glycogen. Nothing in common here except for the fact that glycogen is a polysaccharide made up of many glucose molecules while glucagon is a hormone that regulates glucose levels. So both glucagon and insulin are pretty small hormones made up of, you know, a, a couple of dozen slightly more amino acids. We're going to be using a new a couple of terms, and we're going to start applying these two terms to glucagon as well as insulin but I advise you to learn to apply these two terms to various other hormones that we've studied already so far. So we refer to glucagon as a hyperglycemic hormone, and I know you know that you can translate that by now, literally meaning higher glucose levels in the blood. So literally, this is a hormone that succeeds in raising glucose levels in the blood. So when glucagon is released, it triggers all kinds of things in our cells that are therefore going to help elevate glucose levels in the blood. It's a hyperglycemic hormone. And therefore, we're going to trigger the splitting up of glycogen. So in that sense, glucagon and glycogen have a relationship. And we're going to see that, once again, we're going to try to make new glucose molecules from all kinds of other molecules, such as amino acids, fatty acids, lactic acids, and, and so on. What triggers the release of glucagon? Obviously, when the glucose levels in the blood begin to drop, uh, it's important for glucose levels to stay within homeostatic levels, just like calcium levels need to stay within homeostatic levels, salt levels, etc. We see that this hormone really triggers the liver especially 
particularly since the liver can store glycogen very easily. Insulin is a bit bigger than glucagon and it's made up of a couple of chains. Now insulin works opposite glucagon. In other words, it's going to respond to high levels of glucose in the blood. Let's say you ate a bunch of donuts this morning. That's going to trigger the release of insulin. So therefore it is a hypoglycemic hormone. It decreases glucose levels in the blood. And therefore it's going to prevent the accumulation of more glucose in the blood, obviously, by preventing more gluconeogenesis. And therefore it's going to try to, to uh, make the cells use up the glucose by means of glycolysis. In addition, the cells are going to make sure that there aren't that many amino acids available that could be converted into glucose. So the amino acids are going to be converted into proteins. And similar principle with lipogenesis. Let's make lipids so from the glucose uh, in order to remove glucose and prevent the um, rise of glucose levels in the bloodstream. And so again, we stimulate glucose entry, entry into most body cells such that they can go through glycolysis. And we're also going to see that, especially the liver, our skeletal muscles are going to grab all that glucose and make a polysaccharide out of it called glycogen. And you know by now that process is called glycogenesis. What triggers the release of insulin is definitely increasing levels of glucose, but notice that also any of these other things, such as amino acids and fatty acids that could be converted into glucose, can also trigger uh, release of insulin. Hormones that regulate insulin are going to, of course, be glucagon, because it works opposite, and then a variety of other ones, such as the glucocorticoids, growth hormone, thyroid hormone, and epinephrine. What inhibits the release of insulin is somatostatin, which is your growth hormone inhibiting hormone. We haven't made much time for any of the other hormones to talk about homeostatic imbalances and discuss the hypersecretion of a hormone or the hyposecretion of a hormone. But since diabetes mellitus is so rampant, especially here in New Mexico where we live, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about it. First off, hypersecretion of insulin, as you can imagine, is going to lead to hypoglycemia because basically too much glucose is going to be removed from the bloodstream, sometimes also called hyperinsulism. But hyposecretion, meaning not enough insulin secreted or perhaps not enough insulin can bind to cells. So there might not be enough insulin receptors as well as improper or, or low levels of insulin production. All of those can lead to diabetes mellitus, which literally means um, honey tasting uh, urine, essentially. Mellitus meaning honey. Uh, and that's the way diabetes mellitus was diagnosed in the old days. It's by literally tasting the urine and when it tasted sweet, it was indicative of this condition. It's a condition that is can be described as starving in the land of plenty. And you'll see what we mean by that when we go over the whole process that leads to um, some of the main symptoms of diabetes mellitus. So why do we call diabetes mellitus um, starving in the land of plenty? Well, this becomes quite pretty apparent here when we go through a brief summary of the pathophysiology of this disease. So remember, either there aren't enough insulin receptors on cells or a person literally cannot secrete enough uh, insulin or any at all. And so that results in glucose not being able to be taken in by cells and the glucose stays in the bloodstream after a meal, referred to as hyperglycemia. Now, our body doesn't feel good uh, when this happens. We feel very nauseous and we all know how we respond to feeling nauseous. We tend to panic 
and our fight or flight mechanism kicks in, which means the release of epinephrine and norepinephrine. And these two hormones, which are, or, are short-term response hormones, what do they do? They're going to try to create a, a, an environment for our body that is rich in energy. In other words, let's now release more glucose into the bloodstream because our vital organs are going to need it, right? That's the response uh, that we see with the fight or flight system. So we're going to break down glycogen, we're going to split up our lipids, we're going to create new glucose from all kinds of other molecules, such as amino acids, which we got our hands on by breaking down proteins. So now we're adding all of this extra glucose on top of the glucose that is already present from eating just now. So our glucose levels skyrocket. So they're so high now that there are just not enough transporter proteins in the tubules of our kidneys. Remember the transport maximum reflects the number of protein transporters that um, are present for all of the major solutes in the filtrate. And this results in glucose in the urine called glycosuria. In addition, we'll see that since the cells cannot access glucose, they're going to do anything and everything they can to create energy. And so they're going to start splitting up lipids. Now, when lipids are split up, they're going to generate fatty acids and also these metabolites called ketones. So we, we talk about ketogenesis. Now, the buildup of these fatty acids and ketone bodies leads to acidosis, such as ketoacidosis. You might have heard of that term. And of course, as all these fatty acids begin to accumulate in the blood, we're going to see the lipidemia, literally meaning lipids in the blood. None of these are good things to happen. And consequently, we're going to see that some of these ketone bodies will end up in the urine. So we talk now about ketonuria in addition to glycosuria. Um, it also leads to a, a breath that smells almost like alcohol, more like an acetone breath. And often people with diabetes mellitus are, th are thought to have been drinking alcohol. We see that there are major... Um, electrolyte imbalances occurring, which also are going to lead to acid-base imbalances. So very quickly, these people are not going to feel very good when their glucose levels are skyrocketing. So to continue with why these people don't feel good after they've eaten and they don't have a way to regulate these glucose levels, because of the ketoacidosis that kicks in, um, clearly, their blood pH drops, and you know by now, the way we respond to that is by trying to blow off that carbon dioxide. So often you'll see people uh, beginning to breathe fast when, uh, or when a diabetic has an episode, let's say. Um, you can often tell based on how fast they're breathing. We mentioned the problems with the electrolyte imbalance as well as acid-base acid imbalance, and this can all lead to things such as vomiting and abdominal pain. Of course, the vomiting will then lead to dehydration as well as fatigue. But there are three major signs for diabetes mellitus, referred to as the cardinal signs, and these are very recognizable um, as the person is beginning to really be, uh, express how shall I put it? When a person hasn't been diagnosed yet, these are things that really be begin to become apparent. I clearly remember when I was a kid, my best friend uh, was very skinny, ate all the time, and was um, very thirsty all the time as well. So we see, and, and this is before she was diagnosed, so this was already indicative of what was to come. So because of all the glucose that they're losing in their urine, um, we're going to see that these people are therefore also going to produce a lot of urine, polyuria. Um, that, of course, leads to dehydration, and that therefore leads to lots of drinking, or polydipsia. 
In addition, the cells cannot get to the glucose, even though there's plenty of glucose present in the body, the cells literally can't get to it because insulin is not binding. So the cells are starving and therefore um, these people are very hungry and not very, um, they don't have much weight on them. So lots of weight loss and they feel obviously very fatigued. So the three cardinal signs in summary are polyuria, polydipsia, and polyphagia. So this wraps up our discussion of the endocrine system.